Hi, I'm Andy, and this is the third video in the series How to Write a Programming Language, uh, in which I'm going through uh, a kind of toy language that I wrote, specifically designed to be uh, relatively easy to explain. Um, this is the third one. This is about the evaluator. The first two were about the lexer and the parser, and I guess what I maybe skipped over in those two was uh, why do you break it up into... Why have I broken it up into these three things, the lexer, the parser, and the evaluator? And the, and the short answer is that that's what we've found works. Um, I say we, I mean the human race uh, so far. Um, um, but basically, it's not it's not completely obvious that you would break things up in this way. And when I first started doing uh, this stuff and trying out, I tried to write a, a Lisp interpreter uh, which, by the way, everyone should should do. Um, and I kind of mixed up the lexer and the parser. I didn't know about lexers and parsers, and I mixed them up. Um, I wrote something that was halfway in between, and it really didn't work out. And I, um, so I kind of learned the hard way that, that this, at least for that part of it, that this is a sensible split. And I learned a bit more about it. So, basically, if you make the um, recognizing the, the just the little raw chunks of information into one task, that's the lexer. And then you make kind of organizing those chunks into the kind of the tree shape, which is what you really meant into another part. Uh, then the bit you've got left, the evaluator, even though it's kind of the clever bit, the interesting bit is what we're talking about today. Um, it's not that hard when you've got that other structure already, um, sorted out. Um, this is sort of the, if you get the boring bits out of the way, then the interesting bit is actually fairly straightforward as well. Anyway, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to quickly go over what the lecture and the parser do. Then we're going to talk about what evaluation is. And crucial to that is understanding scope and uh, the way that we implement scope is through these things called environments. Once we've got all that preamble out of the way, we'll open up the code, um, look at the, um, the evaluator for cell. Cell is this uh, toy language that I wrote. We'll, on the way, we'll learn a little bit more about how cell works. If you want to know more, go to the um, GitHub page, andybalem slash uh, github.com slash andybalem slash cell. Um, okay, so again, what is a programming language? It's something that takes in text and then it gets fed through the bit that we saw in the first video, which is called the lexer, which breaks it up into these things called tokens, which are things like uh, a string or a number or a bracket. Uh, then it gets fed into this thing called the parser, which organizes those tokens into a tree shape called a syntax tree, which is basically the shape that was in your head when you uh, wrote that code. Uh, and then that gets passed on to the evaluator, which is the bit we're doing today. And um, the evaluator turns that tree of uh, bits of information that's not yet got any meaning and turns them into meaning by making them behavior. And if we were writing a compiler, what we do here is we, instead of having that arrow going to evaluator, we'd have an arrow going to compiler. And some of the stuff that the compiler has to do is fairly similar to the stuff we're doing in the evaluator, and obviously some of it's different. The compilers have to have environments and scope and things, so we'll, when we get onto that, you'll see. Okay, so, a bit more detailed recap. Um, this, this code at the top is a bit of cell code, there's print x plus 2. Um, the, what the lexer does is breaks that up into things like print and open bracket and x and plus and so on. Um, uh, and then what the parser does is takes those um, broken up tokens, which is what they're called, um, and organizes them into a tree. So here we can see we've got a syntax tree here, which is um, a function call. So the that thing that says call is basically the type of the thing. And then inside that, we've got more trees. We've got this very simple tree, which is just the symbol print. So that's actually a token that came out of the lexer, and the parser's has kind of done nothing with it. It's just stuck it there in the right place in the tree. And then the other part of the syntax tree for a function call is the list of the arguments that you're passing in to that function. In this case, this is a list with only one thing in it. And that thing is itself another little mini syntax tree. This is this operation um, thing. Operation is the type of that bit of the tree. And then the next three things are the kind of the other bits of that uh, syntax tree node. So the plus means what type of operation it is, because it's it, operation means arithmetic operation here. Um, and then two other lex tokens, this symbol x and this number two. Notice here that two is in quotes because it, it we haven't understood it yet. It's um, 
we are the Lexa are, are recognized it as of type number, but we haven't actually we're not yet ready to treat it as a number. What the evaluator is going to do, among other things, um, is start treating it uh, actually as an actual number. Um, something else I should point out is something that we're going to suffer slightly from. It was a decision I made in uh, designing Cell to simplify and shorten the code. Is that um, uh, Lexa tokens and parse trees and values, which are what we get in an evaluator, it turns this stuff into values. All of those are represented in Cell by a Python tuple, uh, which is what these round bracket structures are. So instead of having um, a class, which would have probably helped us uh, recognize this code a little bit more easily, but it would have made it a lot more code probably. Um, I've just used tuples, so this um, round bracket and then open quotes call is just a tuple, and the first thing in the tuple is the string call. Um, hopefully we'll still be able to follow it, um, but I will be, I'll be going through and saying, you know, the second thing in the function call is the list of arguments, and you'll just have to believe me because you're not going to be able to uh, remember or know exactly which bit is which, but um, yeah, I still think it was a, a reasonable decision. But it makes this uh, video just slightly harder to follow. But I'll try and uh, I'll try and keep you going with it. Okay, so uh, the bit of that uh, diagram we saw a bit ago that we're talking about today, as I said, is the evaluator. It takes in this syntax tree and it turns it into behavior. And the way it does that is by finding values, um, resolving values. Um, in the syntax tree. So we start off with a tree shape um, of stuff we don't understand, which is the kind of greeny line stuff. Um, and what we do is each leaves, each of the leaves of that tree, we understand. We turn into a thing called a value. And so it used to be a syntax tree or a lexa token, uh, which is basically, we're just counting lexa tokens as bits of the tree at this point. Um, and we turn it into a value. So for example, that number, which was open quotes two, we're going to turn that into a number which has the actual meaning too. And the difference there is that we can then add it to things which we couldn't have done before or take it away from things or things like that. So what we do is we find the individual values of the leaves of the tree, like it, like is illustrated in that second picture. Then we combine those together themselves as we move up the tree towards the top uh, into values. And then we combine those values together. And we keep going until um, we found the value, which is the end of that statement. And... Um, in the programming language generally, each of those statements will get evaluated into a value and then we'll throw those values away except the last one, which is kind of the return value of the function if we're in a function, or kind of the return value of the program if we get to the end. Um, although in most languages, uh, including Cell, we don't actually print out that value at the end, we just throw it away, uh, which is strange. But actually, uh, the reason for that is because hopefully some kind of side effects have happened in the meantime uh, that you presumably used some of those values. Um, so yeah, weirdly, we do throw it away at the end. Okay, so let's talk about scope. The big thing we're going to be dealing with um, in this video is uh, when we're evaluating values, we're going to be storing those values in symbols, and then we're going to go and, going to be going and looking them up again um, later on. And in order to know which uh, answer we're going to look up, we need to think about scope. So here's an example. Here's a bit of cell code, um, and this. Um, uh, well, hopefully you'll be able to understand this if you've used languages that are a bit like cell um, and you'd think you'd see what you think would be a reasonable behavior here so basically the first line um, stores this this string world in a symbol called x and then the next line um, and then the curly brace and down to the closing curly brace defines a function the line below that um, so that's the way you define a function in cell. You just say function name equals and then some stuff in curly brackets. And curly brackets is, uh, means, uh, the, the function definition. So then after that, we call the function. The function is called myfun and then myfun bracket bracket semicolon means call it. And then the last line, we print x. So once we, when we call the myfun function, then our, we kind of jump back up to after the curly bracket. And our code starts executing in there. And what we do inside the function, remember we could, we set x right at the top to be world, but inside this function, we set x to be hello, comma, and then we print x. Um, and then we come, well, then we finished with that function, we come down and we get to that last line where we print x again. So the question is, what would you expect this program to print? Maybe I'll give you a second to look at it. 
the point is we're using X in two places. So I'm going to show you now what that program prints. It prints Hello World. The reason for that is um, there's an X defined in that outer scope, but then once we're inside the function, we define another X, which is in an inner scope. Then we print that X out, so that's the hello bit. And when we come back out of the function, we haven't changed the value of the X in the outer scope. Um, so we, we, the X kind of comes back to being what it, what it means in this scope. So, um, in the, for the purposes of cell and lots of languages, but certainly in cell, um, you know that you've entered another deeper scope when you see that curly bracket. Um, it's also interesting to ask what would happen inside my fun if we'd never set X, if we just used um, the X from the outside scope. And the answer is we are allowed to do that. Um, and we would have got world. if we. So if we delete that line that, that says X equals hello, then this program would print world world. Because you're allowed to see the stuff in the outside scope. But if you set something it gets set on the inner scope. It's also worth noting at this point that in cell, you're only supposed to use x equals blah once in each scope. So if you did it again, it should be an error. Although I think probably, I think possibly cell has a bug where it doesn't actually tell you you're not allowed to do that. But believe me, you're not because I made it up. Okay, so let's do something a little bit more complicated with scope. This is a nice little test for you. If you like this kind of stuff, you should definitely go and look at my videos about scheme. There's a lot of really good stuff about this. Um, and a lot of cells, um, internal workings work a lot like Lisp. Scheme is a type of Lisp. Okay. So, uh, in this code, we, we start off by defining a function called outer fun. And inside that function, we set a variable x to 12. And then we create inside outer fun, we make another function called inner fun. Um, so we define it there. Um, and the body of it just says print x. So it's referring to that x in that scope that is uh, inside outer fun. And then the last line of outer fun is it's like a return uh, line, but in cell you don't have a return statement. It's just in cell just returns the last thing uh, in that function, uh, the last line. So the last line here is inner fun. So basically outer fun returns as its return value, the function called inner fun. Okay, so then further down in the code, we say thing equals outer fun bracket bracket. So we call outer fun. So outer fun returns inner fun because that's what we've just seen is the return value of outer fun. So when you call outer fun, the answer you get back is this inner fun thing. Um, so now thing has got inner fun in it. And then we call thing, which means we're effectively calling inner fun. So here's a question for you. What will this program print or will it be an error? Well, the answer is it will quite happily print 12. And what this is showing you, um, even though this X uh, is no longer defined when we're at the point where we call thing. Actually, um, the the stuff that's defined for inner fun gets passed around with inner fun. So when we return that function from inside another function, it brings all of those variables with it. Um, and that is called a closure. Um, a closure it comes from the, the word, the idea of something being closed in a mathematical sense, which basically means, in this context, it means um, you've got everything you need with you to to work so um, it, it won't be an error calling this function later it's kind of guaranteed because it carries all the stuff it uses with it okay so anyway point of that is uh, that x is still available to inner fun when you call it even when you call it from outside um, so it picks up its variables from where it kind of where it's written it's called lexical scope because it's uh, it's where that function is written matters where it gets its variables from. Most languages have lexical scope. But not all languages have closures, which is kind of taking those variables with you. Um, especially um, if you've used Java, you won't be very familiar with passing functions as arguments into other functions, uh, at least until Java 8, where it's kind of bodged in. Okay, so that was scope. So that gives us a bit of context about how we want our language to behave. Uh, but now we need to talk about environments, which are the way we implement that um, in cell or in um, any interpreter. So basically, an environment is a place where you can remember symbols, symbols like the X that we were looking at um, in the last couple of slides. And what I want you to think about is that there's environments that kind of contain other environments that contain other environments. So um, you can think of 
the kind of global scope where all the symbols that you would always expect to be there, like print and if, go. You can think of that as being like the world. And then libraries that you're using, things like that, you can think of that as being uh, your town. So there's, maybe there's a JSON parser library and that's like your town. And then there's stuff that you write yourself. Um, so there, here it's called my, fun my function and that. You can think of that as being like your house. So it's like... Uh, the point of this analogy is that the, the the house is contained in the town and the town is contained in the world. So um, when you're in your house, you can still see the, the stuff that's in the world. You can still see print um, because your house is in the world, right? You get it? Anyway, uh, there's a class called Env. Um, and basically what it is is... Uh, it's Cell's way of implementing this idea of an environment. And an environment has... Um, a, a list of uh, a map, sorry, called items. So self dot items here is a map, and it has a pointer to its parent. So this is like the house pointing to the town, or the town pointing to the world. Uh, so self dot parent is that pointer to the so the environment that contains it. So if you want to find a symbol in an environment, what you do is you call get, and you pass in the name of the symbol that you want to find. And what it does is it says if if the name's in self dot items, then return the the answer from uh, self dot items. So that means you know look for it in my house first. Um, but if I don't find it, then check whether I've got a parent. Right. So this is um, elif self dot parent is not none. If we've got a parent, uh, then ask the parent for the name, and obviously that parent will ask its parent, and so on, um, until we run out of parents. And at that point, if we haven't found it, we'll return none. And that's the last line. So all we're saying here is um, go and look up stuff in yourself. And then if you've got a parent, go and look up in your parent as well. And keep going. Um, so that's how it works. That there, there's, there could be an X in that immediate scope that you're in. Or there could be one in one of the outer scopes. This is how that's implemented. Um, and we also have a, a set method, which is much simpler, which basically says if you try and uh, set something in an environment. So you just say, if you say X equals three or something like that, all that happens is it gets added into self dot items in your sort of most inner environment. So if you're in your house and you say X dot set, I mean, you say X equals three, uh, what gets called is this, uh, env dot set for that, for your house. Um, and it gets changed for you, but not for the rest of your town. If that makes any sense. Okay, so now we finally get on to the real code of the evaluator in Cell. So the the kind of core of all this code is this function called eval expr, um, and what it takes in is the expression you want to evaluate, and crucially, it takes in an environment where it gets where it's going to be evaluated. You can't evaluate an expression kind of in isolation. It has to be it has to get evaluated inside a particular environment because that expression might refer to symbols, and you have to look up those symbols in an environment. So here's the main structure. This is a, a very much like the lex function we saw before and the parse function we saw before, um, which uh, had a, this big if elif structure. And there's a slightly more here. There's a little bit more code in this video than the previous ones, but not too much. So basically, what we do is we find the type of the expression we're evaluating. So that's expr bracket zero. Remember, I was saying these things are just tuples, and the first thing in the tuple is the type. Well, here we're getting the type out by asking for the zero thing in the tuple. And then we do a big if based on the type of, of, of uh, this syntax tree element that we're looking at. So for example, if it's a number or a string or something, we do, we do something. So let's go through these one by one and talk about uh, what we do. So the, the simple ones are the things that are just, um, these are just lexa tokens. So if the, if the expression we're evaluating is, is a lexa token of type number, and what we do is we return a value. So remember I said when you're evaluating, you're basically turning syntax trees into uh, values. Well, my definition of a value in cell is it's another tuple, and its type is the first thing again. Um, but then the, the next stuff could be other stuff. So in this case, um, the next stuff um, for, the value, for a value of type number is an actual number. So expr brackets 1 is... Um, that number, but in uh, it's still in quotes, still as a string. So re remember, we saw earlier there was a Alexa token that we had, which was number, and then quotes two was the right hand side. So this expr brackets one in that case would be the string that just has the number two in it. And what we're doing is calling the Python function float to convert that from a string into a floating point number. So actually, in cell, all numbers are floating points, um, even if they look like integers. 
So uh, you can see that this, what the evaluator does is turns um, a syntax tree, or in this case, a lexer token, which is part of the syntax tree, um, into something which has meaning in the sense that uh, it's now it's now been turned from just the the kind of character representation of a number into an actual number that Python understands, which means we can do clever things with it, like add it on to another number. Um, and when you add two and three, you expect to get five, not twenty-three. So um, we've uh, we turn it into a number so that we can perform that kind of operation on it. Uh, oh, bear in mind, by the way, um, I, in cell we've chosen, I've chosen to represent numbers, cell numbers, by uh, numbers in Python, these floating point numbers. Um, but this is the point where we could deviate from um, exactly what Python does. For example, we could use some kind of big number library uh, in Python that means that numbers can be as big as you like, um, not just as big as um, Python floats. Um, we could do something else clever, um, it, like, I don't know, represent them in a different base or something like that. Um, what I've chosen to do here, and this is sort of the part of the implementation choices or the definition of the language choice, is that these numbers get represented as floating, uh, Python floating points, but they could be something else. Um, so, yeah, so it could be something a bit more interesting than just this float bracket. It could be something that does something clever. Okay, so uh, on to the next bit of the if. So we did numbers now, we've got strings. The strings are really, really easy. The value version of a string is basically exactly the same as the lex token version of a string. It has uh, a type of string, and then the second part of it is just the um, the string that, we're, that was between the quotes. So the expr brackets one in this case is just, the le in the lexer token, that is just the string we found, so we just put it in here. So the value uh, is actually going to look exactly like the lexer token, which is maybe slightly confusing. So let's move on. Um, then there's some other stuff that could be there. So um, cell has this special value uh, called none, which is like Python's none value, or null, or things like that that you might have seen in other languages, uh, which kind of represents the lack of anything. And um, that that value none we haven't seen it so far because it's not part of the lexing or the parsing world this is a symbol there's a symbol which is none with a capital n which gets inserted into the global environment just like i was saying print and if uh, belong in the global environment there's another thing called none which belongs in the global environment and that is in actually what gets stored there is actually a special value which has a type none and no other entries um so all this does is says if you find a none uh, that you're expecting to um, uh, use in your and your parse tree in your syntax tree uh, then just re return none if you find none just return none just do nothing to it so we're going to finally get onto something interesting so um, if we have an arithmetic operation so we've got a syntax tree uh, which we've recognized as an arithmetic operation well then the first part of that tuple is going to be the string operation which so we get into this if and what we're going to do is just pass it on to this function called operation. So let's have a look at this function called operation. So again, this operation takes in an expression and an environment, but now we know that expr bracket zero uh, is operational. We wouldn't have got into this function. That's the bit of the if we're in. So now we're, what we need to do is find um, the answer to this operation. So this could be a plus or a minus or a times or a divide. So expr brackets one is that symbol that tells us whether it's plus, minus, times or divide. And then expr brackets two and three are the two arguments to that operation, the two things that are getting added together or taken away. So the first thing we do is get hold of those two arguments. So arg one equals eval expr, expr two, and we pass in that environment again. So what we're doing is we're calling eval expr. So we're recursing back into this eval expr uh, method that we we were in a second ago, <clears throat> gone off into the operation function. But now we're going back into eval expr, but with a different expression. So what we're saying is evaluate for me the left hand side and the right hand side of this plus or minus or whatever. Give it back to me, and we'll put it into arg one. Uh, do that for the right hand side as well. Put that into arg two, and then actually the implementation of plus is very uh, simple here. Um, if you've got if you're adding together two numbers, then all you do. Uh, is return another number, so the type um, of our return value is number, um, and the answer is just arg1 plus arg2. And here again, if we were doing something a bit cleverer, um, instead of just adding up using Python plus here, we could be doing some kind of big num thing or or something else um, clever. Instead, because we're just using Python numbers, 
uh, to represent numbers in cell, we just add them up. You know, you ask to you ask to add them up, so we add them up and we return it in this new value which has um, a type of number. Um, but notice that we evaluated the expressions that were being passed to this plus. So we, um, if we were passed in some complicated uh, expression like calling a function and, and then add the answer from that function to something else, well, we'll have, at this point, we've already worked out what calling that function returned us. That's what that val express stuff near the top does. So now we've got an actual answer out that we can add together with something else. Uh, and if we get if we don't get a plus or a minus or a times or a divide, then we just throw an exception saying, um, I don't know what I don't know what type of operation you're trying to do here, uh, and that should never happen because we should never have a parse tree that says operation, which doesn't have a plus times minus or divide in it. We would have done something else. Probably would have thrown an error earlier on or something. Okay, so back into the main if inside of Al Expra. Uh, now we'll have a look at what happens when we find um, a an expression of type symbol. So that means basically um, you wrote something like the word print or X or something like that with no quotes around it. And that was made into a Alexa token, um, which has uh, the, the string, the type, the string, the first thing in it is just symbol. And the second thing in it is the name of the symbol, like X or print or something like that. Um, and then it went through the abstract, it went through the parser into the syntax tree and basically nothing happened, nothing clever happened to it. Uh, it's just a symbol. So we're just going to look it up. So um, the evaluator does do something interesting with it. It goes and looks it up in the environment. So first thing we need to know is, What's the name of the symbol? So as I said, the first part of this token was just the string symbol, and the, then the second part was the name of the symbol. So we, we just say name equals explorer brackets one to get the name out. And then we, we, we go and ask the environment to get us the answer for that name or what we what it's got what it's got stored under that name in it, inside it. So this is where we get into that get uh, method that I was showing you earlier where it looks up inside itself, and if it doesn't find it, it goes and looks it up in the parent, and then the next parent, and so on and so on. Um, so then the answer comes back and gets put into this thing called ret, and if we didn't find anything at all, we throw, because at this point, if you're uh, in the evaluator, you're trying to evaluate uh, a symbol, but it, you can't find any value stored for it, this must be, you must have referred to something that didn't exist. This would be like saying print x without first saying x equals so and so. And so. so we throw. Uh, again, in cell, as I, as I mentioned in previous videos, um, there's basically no decent error handling at all in cell. That's one of the compromises I made to keep the code as short as possible. So it throws an exception saying you use this symbol, but it doesn't even tell you what line you did it on. So good luck. Um, I must tell you, when I tried to write code in cell, I tried to write a version of cell in cell. I found it extremely painful um, because of stuff like this. But anyway, if we did find the symbol, it's in that variable ret, so we can just say return ret. Okay, so that was looking up a symbol. So the next thing we're going to look at is setting the value of a symbol. So this is the, the statement like x equals 3 or something like that. So this is we're still in the big if, which is all inside of Al Expra, but we've got a bit further down it. And we've, we've now found um, a, a bit of the syntax tree where the type is assignment. So Expra bracket 0 is assignment, basically. So what we need to do is we need to find out, um, if it's x equals 3, we need to find out that name x. We need to find out what you're assigning into. So expr brackets one is basically what was on the left hand side of that equals sign. Uh, and we know that it's a symbol because we checked that in the last video, we checked that that thing has a type of symbol. So expr brackets one means go and find me um, the symbol that was on the left hand side of the equals. And then the, the brackets one again means and now look inside and find the name of that symbol. So that, that symbol will be a, a pair of things, a tuple, and the first thing says symbol, and the second thing is the name of the symbol. So we get the name out, put it into this variable called var name. Um, and then the next thing we do is the next thing in that tuple is this assignment. Um, so expr brackets one was the thing on the left hand side of the equals, and then expr brackets two is the thing on the right hand side of the equals. So so we get out expr brackets two, the thing on the right hand side, and we call eval expr again, uh, passing in the environment to say. Uh, evaluate all that stuff on the right hand side of the equals, which might be a whole load of stuff. It might be three plus four, so it has to go back into that operation bit we were looking at before, or it might be a whole load of other operations. They all end up essentially ending, uh, producing a value at the end. Um, so eval expr will give us back that value, which we put into a variable called val, and then we just set it into the environment. So this, this was, this was an assignment statement, so the, uh, the, the end result we want to be, um, 
uh, that uh, the symbol x is defined with the value 3, or whatever it was, if it was x equals 3. So we just do env.set with the variable name and the value that we want to put in there. And notice that we also return val. So in cell, everything, even an assignment, is actually an expression. So if you say x equals 3, um, that isn't just doing something. Um, it doesn't just have this side effect of making the symbol x be defined with a value 3. It also is itself a value. It, its value in that case would be 3. So we could say something like uh, x equals y equals 3. And actually that would set y to 3, but then the y equals 3 part would return the value 3, so then x would be set to 3 as well. Um, uh, and if you've done stuff in C, you'll find that, um, or other languages, but especially C, you'll find that you can easily make bugs where you meant equals equals and you wrote equals and it lets you do that. Well, cell lets you do it too. Uh, which is basically a bad thing. Um, in cell it makes sense because everything's a value. And cell works like Lisp and it just, you know, just believe me that it's a cool thing to do. And C it's just a horrible thing to do, but you know, it lets you write some nice, uh, hard to understand but slightly shorter code, so we forgive it. Okay, so next in that in this great big if elif set is if we found something which is a function call. So the um, that the way we recognise that is that the first thing in this um, tuple expr uh, is the string call, which means that the type of the bit of the syntax tree we've got to um, is a function call. And again, we pass this off to another function just to make our lives easier. This function's called function call, takes in expression and environment. And what we have to do is we have to find out what actual function you're calling and then the arguments you're passing in. So fun, uh, is, is basically the thing before the round bracket. So the way cell recognizes that you're doing a function call is it sees a round bracket, you know, a normal bracket. Um, so if you say print bracket x, um, it recognizes that that's the function because it found the bracket. So the thing before the bracket is print in that case, and the thing afterwards is all the arguments you're passing in. Um, so we're, in the last video, we saw how to parse all that out and using the commas to separate it and then the close bracket to know we've got to the end. Um, but uh, here we're actually going to actually run that function and actually call it. So first thing we have to do is find the function we're calling. So we say fun equals eval expr, and then the the thing before the round bracket is in expr brackets one. Uh, we we evaluate it in the same environment. So again, we're calling eval expr again recursively to get hold of the actual function object that we want to call. So if it's if it was print x, then uh, print is a symbol. So in order to find the actual function that represents print, we have to call eval expr again um, to go and look up that symbol in our environment and get back um, the the actual function we want to call. So now we've got the actual function we want to call in fun. We now go through all the arguments in uh, uh, in the list of arguments. I'll just scroll that over a bit. So expr brackets 2 has all the arguments in it. So we go through them all, evaluate each of them, and make a list. The answer, we put that into args. And then we got, we're going to break out to two possible uh, things to do here. So there's two types of function, basically. We've only seen one so far. And that's the one that's written by the person actually writing code in cell. Um, so basically fun is another tuple, it's a value of, of type, well it has two possible types. Uh, one type is function and the other type is native. So if you wrote your function in cell code, using the type of code we've seen already with the, with the curly braces, um, then fun bracket zero will be function. But if you're using a function that is part of the standard library of cell and it's not written in cell itself, because there are some functions that you basically can't write in cell, um, because you have to kind of bootstrap, I'll explain that in a second, uh, then then fun bracket zero will be native instead. So uh, let's skip into the bit. So we're in the same function here. We just rearrange things a bit so that we can see the code a bit better. So if, um, so all I've done is expanded the top bit of the if. So if this is a function uh, that was written in cell, then that fun bracket zero will be function. So the first thing we do is we go and find a list of parameters that this function accepts. So what the names of the arguments that this function accepts. And then we call this fail if wrong number of args function. All that does is it checks that the actual arguments we've been given, which are in expr brackets one, has the same length as params. That's all it checks. Got the right number of arguments. If so, we're fine. If not, that throws that function. We won't look at it. It's very simple. It just checks that they have the same length. So assuming now that um, 
that didn't throw, that's because the arguments we've got at the very, very top there have the same, there's the same number of them as there are parameters the function expects to take. So the next thing we need to do is get out the, the body of the function. So that's a list of statements, basically a list of expressions uh, that make up that function. And then also we need to get an environment that was stored inside that function. So we'll get to it. When we, when we get to the bit about actually defining a function, um, we'll see that when you define a function, you actually save an environment with it. So that's how, in that example we saw right near the beginning, that inner, fun inner fun that we looked at, I was carrying an environment around with it. Well, this is where it's stored. It's stored in, in this case, fun brackets three, and it's stored in the third part of that tuple, that Python tuple that represents this function. So we get, we've got fun brackets one, which was the list of parameters that this function takes. Fun brackets two was the, uh, the body or the list of expressions in the function. And fun brackets three was that environment that gets stored with it. And what we immediately do, so we found that environment that was stored in the function when you'd actually defined it. What we immediately do is make a new function. So we call the constructor of env and we pass in fun env. Uh, and what that means is, basically when you pass it into the constructor like that, that means this is your parent. So um, the function had an environment that it was carrying around with it and we make another environment that has that environment as its parent and we call that new environment new env. And then the reason the reason why we did that becomes clear hopefully in the next line is with this for loop for p comma a in zip params comma args. What that is doing is saying it's looping through all the parameters and the arguments. So zip here just means uh, loop, kind of loop through two things at once, loop through the parameters and the arguments together um, and set the parameter name to p and the argument to a. Uh, so what all we're doing is looping through and setting for every parameter that this function expects, we're setting that name to be that argument that we've been supplied. So p brackets one here means because uh, p is actually a symbol, so p bracket zero will just be the string symbol. p brackets one is the name of the symbol. So what we're doing is saying, in our new environment we've just created specifically for this purpose, which will, by the way, be thrown away as soon as we've finished running this function. So it, it doesn't get carried around with the function like the one we talked about before. This environment is just used for this moment. So we make a new environment, we set all those parameter um, names to be the values we've been given in this args list. And then we, and then we run eval list. And eval list actually, all it does is calls eval express, eval expr for everything in the list. So actually, this is another recursive call into eval expr, or actually lots of recursive calls into eval expr for every statement or every expression in that function that we're calling. Um, and the environment it passes in is this new environment. So now that means that you can use the arguments that were passed into the function inside. So if we had a, a function that takes in, um, uh, a parameter called p, or let's call it t because there's too many p's around already. Um, then uh, if you later on inside that function, if you said print t, that wouldn't work unless we'd done this bit of, of looping through, making this new environment, looping through and saying, and setting p to be whatever you passed in as the argument of that function. So that's what happens if we find a function that was written in cell. We basically set all the arguments to be, um, the values of the of the things you passed in, so all the argument names in the, in a new environment, and then we loop through all the uh, expressions in that function one by one, evaluating them. And what eval list does is it, it it evaluates all of them, but it only returns the the last the value of the last thing in the list. So that's how cell ends up with this behavior: the last line of the function is the thing you return because we immediately return the return value of eval list. Okay, so that was if you've written a function in cell. And then the next thing to look at is if you've written a function, um, not if you sorry, if you've called a function that wasn't written in cell, but was a so-called native function. So a good example of a native function in cell is if. So in most languages, if isn't isn't a function at all, it's a statement. But in cell, uh, it is a function. But uh, whilst it would be really nice to write all of our standard um, functions, standard library functions, i.e. Like functions that come with cell, whilst it would be really nice to write them all in cell, at some point there is a limit to that. You, um, in order to write an if function, you, you essentially have to have a concept of if. Um, so you, you can't really write that in cell without having if already defined. So what we do, um, for example, in the if function is we actually write that function in Python and we put it into the environment um, in a tuple where the first um, first thing in that tuple is this string native. So what that means is that when the cell interpreter pulls it out of the environment, because there's a symbol like print or if, 
um, that it finds it, pulls it out, and it sees that um, its type is native, and it treats it differently. It doesn't treat it like the normal uh, functions uh, that, were defined, that were actually written in cell. So what it does is actually a bit simpler. It gets out, uh, fun brackets one is actually the, the Python code, the, fu the Python function, so this is, this is Python code we're in, and then we've stored a Python function in that tuple, in fun brackets one. And then it, um, the next line, params equals inspect dot get arg spec python dot args. What that's doing is using some Python introspection commands to say, um, just look at this Python function and give me the arguments of it. And actually, all, the only thing we're using that for, if that doesn't make sense, because that's slightly weird code, uh, don't worry about it, because all we're doing is using that to check that we were actually given the right number of arguments um, uh, to this uh, to this native function. So all it's doing is using the number of arguments that that function expects. Um, so And it uses that on the next line with this fairly wrong number of args, which is the same function we used before. All it does is checks that the lists are the same length, so just ignore that if it's a problem. Um, and then the last line is where we actually do the work. So we call this function, which is in fun brackets one. By the way, we could have just used the variable pi underscore fun here again. Um, I think I just forgot to uh, factor it that way. Um, so we get hold of that Python function, which was in fun brackets one, and we call it. And we call it with the arguments that we were given. And star args just means, it's called the splat operator. It just means spread out the uh, that list so that you're passing them as arguments into the function. Um, but notice um, before those arguments, we add this uh, additional environment, which is the environment in which to run this function. So when we write our native um, cell functions, we ha they have to expect one more argument um, than than it looks like they take in cell, because actually they take this additional argument, which is what environment should I be running in? Um, and then those args, when they get passed in, will look a bit weird as well. They won't look like... So if it's the number two, it won't just look like a two. It'll look like open bracket, string... To uh, string number comma and then to and close bracket yeah so um, writing these native functions is slightly awkward you have to remember that extra environment uh, that extra argument which is the environment and you have to deal with the fact that uh, the stuff you're getting passed in is um, is not kind of the normal stuff it's like these um, these tuples, these Python tuples. Anyway, that's all a slight sidetrack, but I had to deal with that when I was writing those native functions. The point is, uh, it, it, you can have functions in cell which are actually written in Python. Because the interpreter is written in Python, that works. But if you're writing an interpreter for cell in another language, you would have to write those native functions in some other language. And if you're writing a compiler, which I've also done, so I did a sort of horrible compiler that I'm really ashamed of, that compiles cell into JavaScript, uh, and every time there was an, a function, a native function that I'd originally written in Python in the interpreter, I then had to provide a JavaScript version of that um, function uh, in order for that uh, compiler to emit that um, as part of the, the code that got compiled into JavaScript. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, all right, and then we back, we're right back to... Um, no, we're not. We're not out yet. We're still um, We're still in the thing where you've called a function. Um, and basically, the two the two possibilities are this could be either a function, as in something written in cell, or it could be native. Otherwise, you tried to call something that wasn't a function. So if you wrote three brackets, three open bracket, four close bracket in cell, uh, you'd get this error saying not a function, uh, because three is not a function, so you can't call it. Okay, so now we're back into eval expra. We've gone, we've got through a lot of if, elif, if, elif, 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 elif bits. Um, and we're down to, um, if we've got a syntax tree where the type of that syntax tree, as in, so the first thing, um, in that tuple is the string function. That means, uh, you're trying to define a function. So before we looked at what was happening when it was call, which was, you were trying to call a function. And then we went and got that function and we looked for something with type function. Well, that was how, that was what we do with functions. We call them. This is how we actually define functions. So this is how you end up with something where that string, um, where that type is function. Basically, if we found a syntax tree with a type of function, then what, uh, then the value that we return, which is a kind of living function definition, a syntax tree is kind of a dead abstract way of expressing a function, whereas this is a value. This thing we're returning here is a value, which is, um, which is a, an actual function. What we do is, we make a tuple, and the first string is function. The second string is the 
the whatever the second string of the uh, syntax tree was, which was the function that you're actually uh, the thing that you're. Um, no, 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 I'm lying. Um, yeah, the first, yeah, expira brackets one is the list of parameters that this function takes, and expira brackets two is the all the expressions that make up the body of this function. But we add on an extra thing, which is an environment. So this is the point where we take a copy of the the current environment we're evaluating in, which is env with a small e. We create a new environment called uh, with, with the constructor, which is n with a capital E. So what we're saying is basically, um, the, when we give you this function, when I give you this function, it's also going to come with the environment that it, it was defined inside. So even if we pass this function around as an argument, like we saw in an early on example, um, it, it will carry its environment with it. So we can still call it later, and it will still be able to see the things uh, that were part of its environment when it was defined. So that's how it all works that we're carrying our, our stuff around. That's how the closure works. Uh, and then finally, if we get to the end of this uh, great function, all the ifs, elifs, ifs, elifs, um, and we haven't yet recognized the bit of syntax tree that we're dealing with, we throw an exception saying um, unknown exp expression type, which I think should never happen. Uh, and that's basically how the evaluator works. So um, we we go through go through all the tips of the tree, turning things into values, then combine them together into bigger values, bigger values. We end up with one value at the end, which we then throw away and don't use. Um, but in the meantime, some side effects have happened. And in cell, the only way you can make side effects is by calling one of the native functions, or at least built-in functions that have side effects, um, uh, for example, print, and the side effect of print is that it prints out the value um, that you're passing in. So it's quite a direct way of getting those values out of the program, which is quite important if you want your program to actually do something. Uh, and that's it. So um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, series of, of videos about how to make a programming language. It's, I, there are po other things I possibly could talk about if people are interested, so do leave a comment if you'd like. Other things I could talk about would be the standard library for cell, so how we actually write functions that become part of um, the language for the person who's using it. Uh, the other bits, the other bit we could talk about um, is how to write a compiler. And the compiler that I've written at the moment is not very good, but it might just possibly serve as an example. Or if people were really enthusiastic, maybe I could try and write a proper compiler. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, do leave a comment, uh, make suggestions for other videos. Uh, if you want to encourage me to make more videos, uh, go to my Patreon page where you can sign up to uh, donate like one dollar for every video I make or something like that. That would be lovely and encouraging. Thank you for doing that, those people who do it. Um, also, uh, please do go and uh, have a look at my game, which works on Android and on your computer. It's called Rabbit Escape. Uh, and it's a bit like lemmings, and you have to uh, rescue rabbits, get them to the exit. Um, you can get it on the Google Play Store for 60p, um, or you can download it for free from my website, uh, which you're very welcome to do, especially if you make new levels for it. There's an explanation of how to make new levels, uh, or get involved with helping me code it. It's all written in Java, so it works nicely on Android. Uh, do play it. Um, uh, I think it's quite fun. Uh, more information, things you might want to look up. Uh, all, all my videos are on my YouTube channel, username AJ Balaam. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I have a blog where I, all my videos come up on there and also other things I've figured out. Recently I've been trying to figure out how to do basic stuff in Haskell, which has been a lot of fun. Um, you can find most of my open source projects on artificialworlds.net. You can find uh, Cell and lots of other code on GitHub. And uh, see you next time.